What is up, podcast land? Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates in the Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Uh, before I introduce this guy here, Jeff Cochran, you're going to love him. Um, pastor, speaker, podcast host, coach, life coach, you name it. The guy's got all the gifts of, uh, of service that you could think of. Um, I want to first tell everybody where they can hear the podcast. Pretty much everywhere. Uh, iTunes, iHeart, Pandora, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts is where you can find the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. All I ask is that you subscribe and then hit that automatic download. And if there's a little bell for notifications, click on that too. That'd be great. Um, where do you can learn more about me? MattKubler.com, my name.com. And that's where you can learn more about my career and the book I wrote, uh, A Brother's Love and Memoir, which is a book I wrote uh, 15 years ago. I just had the 15 year anniversary. Uh, it's a book about my life story growing up with my autistic older brother, Andy, who um, sadly passed away in a car accident in 1989. And it just shares our life story and the and the, the journey of healing I had to go through after his death that um, I've found is, is was cathartic for me, but also has been helpful to other people who suffered trauma and are, are struggling with how to cope because they can learn from my mistakes. And that's kind of what this book was meant for. And it's the greatest accomplishment of my life. So for more information, go to mattkubler.com. And you can also get it on Amazon or wherever else you, you buy books online. So without further ado, Jeff Cochran. What's up, buddy? Hey, man. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on today. Dude, it's going to be fun. I, uh, it's, you know, I, I, you're my 105th episode. Wow. I just did one last night, um, and, and you got to watch that one. It, it's with uh, his name's Nick. His name's Nick Fergus, but he goes by Nick Lightning. He is a uh, local Philly guy, autistic adult, 44 years old, mm. who lives the life of a rock star. He puts on uh, one concert a year, and he doesn't know how to play any instruments. He can't sing it for, for a lick, but he wears, he puts on a full stage production at a local rec center in Philadelphia, and he's Nick Lightning, and he, and he lip syncs and sometimes sings over the songs, air guitars, air, air keyboards, air drums but he lives in his world where that's real and i want to live in that world like, oh yeah i, I listened to... this morning because oh, i'm on just... the automatic download yeah. so when i was getting ready you know your podcast came up after a short one i listened to and i was like god this is different but his story is awesome so if you're if you're listening here and you haven't listened to that one go listen to that one he, he's inspirational it was it, it touched my heart because my brother was autistic and so i felt like i was talking to my brother a little bit and uh just the joy and gratitude that he exudes um, and his, you know, he, he, he tells stories about like, there's a documentary film coming out about him that I saw and it's brilliant. Um, and it's going to, I think it's going to be a national hit uh, just because Nick is such a personable guy and it's all real and true and it's no shtick, but his, he believes he's toward the, the, the world. Like he's been, he talks about the pyrotechnic shows in Japan that he did that there's no footage of, but it happened. Like this, in his mind, that was a real event that occurred and it, it helps build him up. And he talks about, the, you know, this 28 years now of doing these shows and how it's a six month long preparation time for this one culmination of this show. And it's just, it mm -hmm. was just a brilliant um, time for me to share with him and his, his friend and my mutual friend with his, uh, Frank, who's his best friend and their relationship and just reminds me of me and my brother. So it was a really special yeah. moment last night that I got to spend with him. So you're, you're, you've got a lot of, a lot of titles, a lot of roles. Yeah. You're like, which is the one that you think is, is the one that identifies who you are the most? That's the one I don't use a ton because people don't know what it means till they know me. But uh, Matt, I like to think I'm a people launcher before anything else. I, I want to launch people into their full potential. I, I, I want to be where, wherever I'm connecting with somebody whether it's I'm consulting with a business leader or coming into a large organization or a large church or a large nonprofit to try to help them, you know, scale a new obstacle or whether it's with someone as a life coach or doing a course, everything I do, the whole goal is to find the greatness inside of the person on the other side of the chair, on the other side of the table and to pull it out. And, and my, really my hope is that when I leave every conversation, that every single conversation I have that people will go, Hey, I believe bigger about myself after being with that guy. I don't know what it is about Jeff, but I believe bigger about myself when I'm with him. And 
Uh, man, I know I, I blow it sometimes. Sometimes I, I leave people and they feel less because I've made a mistake or because I've not had a good day. But my goal is to make as many of those conversations as possible count and to really be the guy. You know, there's, there's always the people. There's people who do great things. Everybody knows their name. And then there's the people who, when you talk to people who do great things, the same names keep coming up and you go, gosh, I wish I could meet that guy. I want to be the name behind some of the names, really. Um, I want people to stand and say, I, I stepped into my full potential. I lived a life that I loved. And a lot of it was because of this guy, Jeff Cochran, when I got to meet him. So, uh, man, I just believe people, most people live life scared and they live life waiting to live life. So right. I want to help people, you know, get unstuck, stop waiting, start living and going after what God put inside of them right now, because what God put inside of you, what God put inside of me, we all have something and I believe it's a gift to the world. So I don't want to steal that gift from the world. And I believe that my gift that God gave me is to pull the greatness out of other people and to say, Hey, can I show you the gift I see in you? And let's talk about some ways that you could get that out. So, um, really it's just what I want to be, man, as a champion of people. I love people. I love to talk. My wife makes fun of me all the time and, you know, says I've never met a person I can't have a conversation with and go deep and go fast. But, um, life is too short to just focus on me and to just focus on the next and to just focus on living day in and, and day out. I want to make it count. Now that I ended that. So I asked that question first because I, I like to, what you do isn't always who you are, or it may just be a component of who you are. Yeah. Um, when I interview a suspect or a victim in my job as a cop, in order to really, first of all, dial in their, their intentions and their behaviors and understanding their, their baseline, you ask a very broad question that allows them to think bigger or forces them to think bigger that then allows you to get smaller in focus as you go on. So mm -hmm. I always ask a broad question first in order to get people to open up and sort of see where their brain goes in that initial question. And yeah. then that's how the show is sort of constructed. So you're no different than anybody else. I'm going to ask you the same question. I've done 104 other yeah. times. Who is Jeff Cochran? Yeah. Well, I hope that I am that people launcher that I talked about. I, I hope that I'm a catalyst, you know, for people, but, um, more than anything, I really, I just don't want to be Matt, a guy who plays it safe. And I don't want people who are around me to feel comfortable playing it safe. So, you know, it's, it, it's pretty clear if you want to play life safe, if you don't want to go for great things, you're not going to be comfortable around me long, not because I, I don't love you or because I don't believe in you, but I'm going to push you. Like all of my friends, I talked to a friend yesterday and, and the first question I asked him is, why have you not started that podcast? You know, he's had a podcast he's been working on, you know, talking about for about six months now. And I'm like, dude, it's going to be awesome, but you've got to get it out. Just start, right? You know, I've got another friend who is, uh, he, he's got a book on his heart. And every time we talk, he knows that I'm going to ask him, have you started writing the book yet? What's holding you back? So, um, that's just who I am, man. I, I believe in other people more than I believe in myself. But over the past few years, I've really discovered just the power of self-belief, of believing. The best way I know how to put it, because I was a pastor for 17 years, and I'm still a pastor. I just don't work day-to-day -day in the local church. So, um, But what I've seen is when we believe that what God said about us was true, we live differently, Right. Not what someone else who said they represented God said about you. That's not what I'm talking about, right? But when we believe what God said about us is true, we lead, different, we lead and live differently. It changes everything. So I want to be that voice for people because it changed my life when I started living like, hey, I am a chosen son of God, that, that God did create me with greatness in me, with things in me. And when people find out what that is inside of them and they start chasing after these little dreams, these micro dreams, they realize that when you chase what God put inside of you, I think it's a lot easier to catch. If you spend your life trying to chase somebody else's life, you're never going to catch it. It's never going to work for you because you were uniquely created not to be somebody else, right? Like as much as I admire you, if I try to be Matt Kubler, dude, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail hard. If you try to be Jeff Cochran, you're going to fail. But if I can be the best Jeff Cochran I can be, then I can help a few people. If I can help the people around me become the best version of themselves, I can help them. I can help me. And life's a heck of a lot more fun. So um, that that's kind of who I am. And I, I'm definitely a challenger, but a challenger with a smile. I love to talk to people. I believe big, but um, the status quo is not, is not a place where you can be comfortable living. 
and us spend much time together, you know, because I dream every day I wake up and it's just kind of, hey, what's the next big thing for me, for someone in my life, for someone who's orbiting around me? Um, because I really think the world, we, we got two problems that are holding us back probably more than anything. One is lack of self-belief. We think too small. And two is a lack of leadership. We have people who know what's right, but they can't step up and speak it and say, hey, this is right. This is wrong. And they don't know how to speak it in love because they had that insecurity, that lack of self-belief. So if we can just help elevate people into this is who you are, live into that and do what you know is right, then man, people's lives just change. And I want to be that guy. I want, I want my funeral line to be obnoxiously long, Matt. Dude, like, really? Jeff, stop. I literally, and we, and for everybody, I've never met Jeff. We've never had a conversation until right now. We've linked in, connected. This is brand new. I literally tell this story and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to jump back into you in a second, but I got to tell you, this is yeah. weird. My brother, Andy died. In 1989, my brother was autistic, stuttered profusely, and this is in the you know growing up in the 70s and 80s, living in low-income housing. You, we didn't weren't around the most loving and giving people who understand my brother. He didn't have friends. He didn't get invited to birthday parties. He didn't get asked out to come yeah. play. He didn't wasn't on sports teams. He didn't do any of those things that would create that that bond with another person. Pretty much, it was me and anyone else I was with were his friends through me. But at his funeral, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Hmm. And I never understood, I was very angry and I, it took me a long time to realize who these people were and why they were there. And my brother, every summer from the time he was a freshman in high school till like five years later, six years later, when he graduated, he never graduated, but they said he graduated. He worked every summer at this, this Christian camp, um, doing like yard stuff and trimming bushes and cutting grass and whatever. And he would stay there for the summer. It was nearby. It wasn't very far from our home. And I didn't know that world. I didn't know anybody in that world. I didn't know those people. I didn't go there. Mm -hmm. We would go pick them up when he wanted to come home or do laundry or whatever. But there was no, I didn't get to interact with these people. So I didn't know the magnitude of the volume of people that my brother had a chance to connect with every summer for five years. And it wasn't until after I wrote the book and people started to come out to buy the book to would tell me stories about their Andy story. Yeah. And I realized that all the people that were at his funeral, all these people that he connected with in another world that I wasn't privy to, where he wasn't weak and didn't have insecurities and wasn't disabled, had all, he was perfect there. So we had all these people who loved him in a different capacity than I knew existed. And when I learned it initially, I was like, ah, why didn't I get to know that? But then I was like, yeah. fuck, my brother lived an amazing life. And what I was angry about for all these years, 13 years of depression after he died was that I didn't think he lived. And I realized that my brother lived an amazing yeah. 21 years. And my, I always tell this, and the reason why I'm getting to the point is that I tell people all the time that I work as hard as I do and I do as many things as I do. And I try to be as good of a person as many people as I possibly can because I want to never be forgotten. I want my funeral. Mm -hmm to be enormous. I want my resume to be the longest. I want people to go, Matt Kubler lived a life worthy of remembrance. So when That's you right. say you want your, your funeral procession to be as long as possible, I totally get that. Yeah. But that makes sense to me. And, and the fact that we're all dying. Every day we're closer to death. And we don't know what God's plan is for us. And when we're going to die, my brother's, you know, God called him home at 21. And I don't know if tomorrow's my day. Today might be my day. Hmm. I want to know that every day that I live, though, was intentional. That's right. And I think what you're doing and what I try to do is I want people to have that appreciation for the, the fact that life is, is not, it's not a given. There's nothing promised. And that if you live intentionally to do good in the world, that no matter when your time is called, it will have been with the designed purpose that God gave it. Oh, yeah. And I remember early, early on, I was still in uh, coming out of the end of high school. I hadn't been a Christian very long. I was the opposite, man. Most people who knew me in early high school would have said Jeff's more likely to end up in, in jail than in ministry. 
right? But um, I remember not long after coming to Christ, going to a funeral with my youth pastor, and it was for the pastor at this this large church I was going to, but I'd never met him because he had been sick with cancer. His name was Bob Bell, and he passed away. And I'm going to this funeral with my youth pastor, feeling really awkward about it because I just didn't know, you know, who this guy was. But I realized there was something different about him when I got there because this is a massive church, massive parking lot. And I'm talking the the line just wound for miles around and around the parking lot of, of people out of their cars waiting, right, to get in the building. And I'll never forget talking to my youth pastor, John. And I'm just like, what are all these people here for? And he's like, Bob lived his life for this moment. He lived his life for this line. He said, Jeff, you have a choice every day. You can live your life for you or you can live your life for the line. And I've never forgotten it. Like I was probably 17 when I heard that. Brilliant. It won't let go of me. So when I think about that same thing as you, man, I want my funeral to be obnoxiously long. I want it to be an absolute party. You know, people, people are going to be sad, hopefully because I'm gone, but I want them to be more celebratory that, that God used me in some way to pull something out of them, you know? And, and that's my hope. That's my prayer. Um, and that's why I live every day the way that I live it, man. I just, I want to make that impact for people. And you talked about resume a minute ago. Like when people start asking me my resume, the best thing I can do is to tell them not a brand name, but to tell them the name of that business leader, to tell them the name of, of that person who started writing that book or started that podcast or to tell them the name of that pastor. I'm going to tell them names because people are our resume. Yep. People are our legacy. If your resume is talking about you all the time, you're you're not worth more than the task you're doing, probably. But if your resume is about other people, holy cow, it, it's worth about anything to get you into an organization, to get you into a team, because you're going to make everybody better. And that's and, and that's such a great point because, and I heard that I was out speaking for a company that was like their annual sales training meeting, and they brought bringing the speakers. And I was one of the speakers they brought in. Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to them about why do they live? Like, what is your purpose in life? You know, you can have a job and that job will be what provides you your sustenance and, and provides for your family and, and, and provides a roof over your head, whatever. And so what is your purpose? Like, you're all here. You're all, you have lives outside of your, your work environment. Why do we live? What is our purpose yep. of living? And the CEO raises his hand and I said, you know, when you die, what do you want to be remembered for? And he goes, well, I heard this, this quote once, and I'm sure you've heard this. He goes, you die twice, once when you take your last breath and once when the last time your name is spoken. And I think your resume, when you can, when someone else can tell of you, your impact in their life is your, it's the reason why we're still talking about Abraham Lincoln or a Martin Luther King Jr. or because yeah. of the impact they had in lives and the grand scale in which that happened. And I think I don't ever want, and I wrote this book so that my brother who never had a friend call or any been invited out to play or included on a, picked in a dodgeball game, my brothers will never be forgotten. That's right. This book will live forever. And that's when you have that ability to be always in someone's thought or always in, in the context of a conversation or getting your name gets brought up that's when you know you're you've done you've done God's work and you've done it well. Yeah, I was um, at a event yesterday, you know, just kind of a, a pre-Easter event with some families, and all of a sudden I looked up. I was having a conversation with um, a young man who I've known for probably five six years. He's in his second year of college. I'm having a conversation with him, and I look up, and we're being stared at by probably you know eight nine different people. And uh, another you know pastor friend looked at me, and and he said, "Are you preaching again?" And I said, always, right? Everybody's laughing, you know, and, and it's a, they know I get passionate and I get intense, but I'm not preaching at a person. I'm trying to preach everywhere I go. I'm trying to preach to the person, like to that person inside of you that is dying to get out, right? And uh, I want to leave people with that inspiration. But, you know, it's, it's also, if you're not ready for that, I'm an intense guy. If you're not ready for that, people are going to say, gosh, Jeff is intense. Well, I, I, I can't be more intense about your dream than you are. I can't be more intense about your life than you are. So if you're ready to step into something, if you're ready to say, hey, I want to live my best life, I'm a guy that people are going to love to be around. 
if you say, Hey, you know what? Average is good for me. I, you're going to hate me. Right. So, and it's kind of that way. And I've, I've had to get okay with that. The people are going to love me. People are going to hate me. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but I'm going to be fully me where I go and try to fully engage everybody to be fully them. I love that. You said, dude, this is just, it's like we're, we're in different fields, but the same approach. People are like, Matt, you're a bit much. Like I get that a lot. You're, you're just, you're just a little bit much for me. I'm not, I can't handle all, all, all that you are is way more than I'm ready for. <laughs> and I'm like, I get it. I'm, and, and I tell people, I'm not, I'm not trying to be me for you. This is just me. And if this is something that you want in your life, if I can help you with something, then, then we're going to get along great. But if not, I'm okay with, if I'm not, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. it, I love, I love knowing that I'm in control of my own intentions. And I love the fact that my commitment to life is non-negotiable. Like mm-hmm. I don't, I don't change with the tides. I don't, um, allow others to dictate how I approach life. And, yeah. and I think that's one of the strongest attributes that I have. It, it also is one of my uh, first things people attack, but mm-hmm. it, it's, it's the thing that I'm the most proud of is that I'm convicted. And, and when, I'm, when you ask anybody about who I am, they always say, if I'm nothing if I'm not committed. Yeah. And I don't always make the right choices. I may not be committed all the time in the right direction with the right, with the right actions, but I'm always committed. And yeah. I don't like that. I'm like a pit bull with a, with a chew toy. And uh, I will, I will complete the mission. And that's, that's probably the military and law enforcement side coming out of me, but I, I do believe in the divinity of, of my life and why I'm here. Yeah. And, and I think what you're doing, and I want to get to the, to how this all started how did jeff cochran become jeff cochran you said you you know in high school people thought you were probably more adventure towards the prison route than than the, the yeah. preacher route but how did you get like my light bulb came on at a moment like i remember when like i've always been in a service mode but i didn't serve with a with a with an intention of serving i just served out of almost reflex yeah. I was always a protector. I was always in this role with my brother and, and a survivor and a, and a, you know, always found a way to get what I needed, whether it was money for new sneakers or whatever, whatever I needed to do, I need, I found a way to do it, but I didn't always have an intentional purpose behind what I was doing until I had an aha moment. What was your transition from the, the prior you when you were younger to when, and everybody evolves, I get that. And everybody has yeah. hurdles and, and changes in who their personality is as they grow and experience things. But when did you figure out who you were? Yeah. Well, probably multiple times. Cause I, I think I, I'm discovering more of who I am, you know, with, with every passing year. And I hope that other people are too. It's not one wake up moment. It's a life of wake up moments and waking up into that potential. But when I was, uh, I was 15 years old, was freshman in high school, uh, man, I would just, I, I was unhappy with my life. I was unsatisfied with my life and I would, I would do anything I could to get high. I didn't care whether it was taking a pill. I didn't care whether I knew what the pill was. I didn't care whether it was, you know, whether it was smoking, whether it was shooting up, whatever it was. If I could get high, I'd get high. If I could drink, I would drink. So I was really just in search of the next high. I didn't even really have a drug of choice at that point. I just always wanted to be I wanted to be high. It was easier to deal with life that way. And I was pretty high functioning with it. You know, I was smart, um, played sports, did things well. And for a while, people didn't know unless they were close enough to me to know. But um, I was getting ready for Thanksgiving, right before Thanksgiving break, my freshman year. I just started dating a girl and I got caught by a teacher selling drugs in the bathroom, got expelled 365 days arrested for drug trafficking in my school. Okay. Um, ended up spending probably the next almost eight months. Most of that year, I, I was able to get back into school a little quicker in 365, but a lot of that was just spent, man, by myself. I was at a school that was ran, you know, a, a lot like a prison. You went in 
in the beginning of the day, you didn't speak unless you were spoken to. Um, long before COVID, we were six feet apart at all times. You know, you had somebody going in the bathroom with you at random a couple of times a week for drug tests, court-ordered anger management. I wasn't in a good spot. And if I wasn't at school or I wasn't at court-ordered anger management or one of those things, I was supposed to be on house arrest. So I had to be at my house. You couldn't leave. And it was just, it was crazy, man, because everybody that I thought was a friend was gone, like immediately. Because now I'm the guy that, man, I, I'm bringing the heat with me wherever I'm at. People are watching and I can't go anywhere without everybody knowing. And, uh, but one person stuck near to me and it was my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. We hadn't only been dating for a couple of months and, uh, my parents wouldn't let me talk to her. She couldn't come over. Nothing. She literally wrote me letters for months and said, I believe there's more in you. I don't believe that, that this is done. And so I uh, fast forward kind of that summer. Um, one of the first things I was getting an opportunity to do um, to really go out and do was, hey, you, you've been clean, you've been doing well, you can go to this youth camp if you want. And my girlfriend, you know, told me, if you don't come to this youth camp with me, I'm breaking up with you. Because basically, she couldn't believe in me more than I believed in myself. You know, one of the earliest people to challenge me and well, I didn't want to get broken up with. So I went and went with, you know, weed in my backpack another friend who went, who didn't want to go. And we were just trying to figure out, Hey, how are we going to get high? Cause I'm getting enough pressure off of me where I think I can do this now, you know? And, and I realized probably about three days in that camp, as I'm sitting there, my friend went off to get high and I made the decision. I said, you know what? I'm not gonna, like, I can't do this again. I can't go back and do this again. And I found myself sitting alone because it separated guys and girls. I was sitting alone in this group of probably 400 people an outdoor pavilion on a concrete floor. And I don't remember what the preacher talked about, Matt. I don't remember what the, the theme was. I don't remember anything that happened about that night, except for I remember getting on my knees on a concrete floor, leaning against my chair and just sobbing and weeping and breaking down like I'd never broken down before and just was really brutally honest with God. If all this is real and you can do something with my life, it's yours. Because I have wrecked it. I've wrecked it. I'm, I'm 16 now at the time. I have wrecked this thing. I have no freedom. I have no anything. And the only good decision I made was not to do what I planned to do because I'm headed toward wrecking this again immediately. I'm about to end up right back in the ditch. And so I just said, God, if you can do anything with my life, it's yours. And literally, man, that, that night when I got up off that floor and I bet I just I sobbed and, and dealt with God for about an hour. But when I got up, I was different. And it's hard to describe, but I've never been the same because I just said, God, I'm going all in to see if what you said was true. And God has met me every step of the way. He's met me every single step of the way. And I've discovered more and more about myself. So um, I did a total 180. And the hard part was it took the next three years for people to realize it was true. People thought I was putting on an act. Right. You can't change like that. Right. And, but I did it married my wife coming out of you know, coming out of high school, we've been doing ministry and business stuff together. But really, a, a couple of years ago, I had another wake up call. And I went to a counselor as a pastor, everything I was doing was was pretty successful. I'm working at a really good church. But I went to a counselor and he said, Hey, why are you here? And I said, I, I don't know, but I know I'm not as healthy as I could be. I know there's something that I have not dealt with. And um, man, I just don't deal with emotions. Well, I lost my sister at an early age. Um, you know, she was 28. And I was you know, gosh, 23, um, when we lost her and to a drug overdose at a party. So I never dealt with that, had other family stuff I'd never dealt with. And I would just push it away and push it away. And I said, okay, I think I've got to deal with some of this or I'm going to be stuck. And, um, man, it was out of that, that I, I really realized what it was like to be healthy. And I cannot be the man that I'm called to be for other people. If I'm still insecure about who I am. So I had to deal with all the demons in the closet, man, and, and do all that. And, Really, it's funny because my book that just came out, Next Level Leader, I write in it, it came out of me taking the biggest church job I'd ever had. And I started writing the book, sharing what I'd learned because I realized I wasn't a good enough leader to be there. And I was going to be found out as a fraud if I didn't grow and if I didn't develop. And, um, but being able to change that mindset to being able to say, you know what, I don't have what I need in every situation. But being healthy doesn't mean you have everything you need. It doesn't mean that you say no to something if you don't have what it takes in that moment. What it does mean is you believe in yourself enough to know, hey, can I accomplish this or not? And if I can, I'm going to run toward it. I'm going to fight for it. 
um, with myself, with other people as much as I can. And if not, I need somebody to be honest with me, but um, man, it really freed me up because after spending time with that counselor, I realized I was letting things that happened to me when I was seven years old. Things my dad said to me when I was seven years old dictate how I live my life. Um, I just don't want to do it anymore. So that really set me free. And now I'm kind of on a journey with that with other people is, is I'll ask that question a lot, Matt. Somebody will say something, a limiting belief like crazy. And I'll say, hey, who told you you couldn't do that? And you see the wheels start turning, right? And they'll tell me and I'll say, no, 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 who told you before that? Who told you before that? Most of us are letting something that someone said to us in childhood define our 30s, 40s, and 50s and steal our life. It's funny that, so the reason why I asked the question about the, their, I can sense your, your confidence in your leadership and how you lead and, and where your leadership values come from and your, your commitment to God very clearly. But everybody, and this is, you know, I've had 105 conversations now. Mm-hmm. And on top of all the other real life conversations I've had not on, on a podcast, every great leader, every great faith leader has had a, and this is, I don't think there's one that hasn't that I've talked to, start to the point where they're not connected to God. Mm-hmm. There's a moment where God comes into their life that is definable. It's not, it's not a, oh, I just sort of started going to church and through time and absorption of the word, it just sort of happened. Yeah. There's always a defining moment. And it's when you, you know, my background's in human behavior and body language. And when I love doing video so I can watch body language as someone's telling a story and reliving a story, you can tell whether or not the words and their body language match and their micro expressions on their face. And yep. yours were as genuine as they come. But that you went back to the to that moment when you're kneeling on the concrete floor, sobbing yeah. on a chair, and when you said, and, and I don't know if, if consciously we're aware of this, when you said the only person that was there for you when everybody left was your wife, you got a little bit choked up there for a microsecond. Your eyes got very emotional, and when everybody that is in the, the track that you're on, and, and hopefully the track that I'm on. And serving and helping others yeah. has had that moment. And I pray everybody has that moment, right? You have to have 100%. that surrender to God that um, I'm yours, mold me how you need me. And, and I try every day, and I say this for every day, please give me the strength and courage to be the man you need me to be. And oh. that's literally my only goal every day is did I live the day with the strength and character and moral commitment to you, God, as you intended me to. And I think, and I'm not a preachy guy. I'm not a fire and brimstone Bible guy. I may not even be the most Christian guy, but I'm the most spiritual person I know. My connectivity to God. I don't go to church. I have issues with that, but growing up as a son of a pastor, it has its issues. Um, but my connection to God has never been stronger than it has been since yeah. 2002 on. And that's why when I asked that question, when did you have your, your moment? And yes, I've been growing since 2002. But that day when the change happened, I, I can relive it a million times until yeah. it, with as much clarity and conviction today 21 years later 20 years later than as i did that day yeah you never when, forget it when you think i wrote a book about my life and when you get a chance to relive your life again by writing a book about it it's very cathartic when you are when you wrote your book was it more of a a way of 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 getting your process out on how you uh, approach your day-to-day desire to help other people? Or was there some, some level of, um, can I write a book? Is it in me? Do I have the ability to take what's yeah. inside of me and put it into words so that someone can pick it up and read and learn? What was the, the impetus behind the book? Because I know what mine was. Yeah. 
but I, there, were, I think there was more than one, you know, we have so many, so many different things going on inside of us. The first one was I had stumbled upon. So, and I remember getting this job. So I went from being at a, a church at the time where I was leading a youth ministry of a hundred total people on the best of days, right. To leading a ministry of over a thousand a month, thousand teenagers a month, 500 a week, um, hundreds of volunteers. And I, I just, I had all the confidence in the world that I could do it. And when the last interview was done and they offered me the job and I hung up the phone, this wave of insecurity hit and it was, holy crap, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, they realized I don't know, you know, what, what I think I know. So I wrote down on a notepad in the middle of nowhere, Alabama, in my office, right after accepting this job, hadn't told anybody what separates average leaders from those who go to the next level. And man, I just started asking that question to any leader I could find that was ahead of me, right? And I started asking it over time. My leadership started taking off. People started noticing a difference in me. But then I started getting into rooms with people that, you know, often people don't get to get in the rooms with, right? Like I had a chance to meet people like John Maxwell. I've had a chance to meet just some crazy good leaders across the country for moments. And when I only had moments, I would say, well, what question could I ask them? It's that question. So the book, first of all, came out of when I realized everybody was saying the same 15 things. They were saying the same things over and over again, right? That was the first thing was I said, this should be a book because most people are not going to ask these questions. I know I carry a different confidence and most people aren't going to call people out of the blue and, and say, hey, you know, can I ask you a question? Can you pour into me leadership? You know, I, I want to get better because the no's, man, the, the no's are hard. A lot of people tell you no. A lot of people ignore you. A lot of people don't want to have that time for you. Um, even the time I met John Maxwell, it came on the heels of five times being told no in the same day you're not going to get to meet him. Man, I just persistent, right? So I knew people weren't going to be persistent. So I said, hey, I want to write the book so that other people can see this because every leader who's been great has approached it the same ways, like with the same macro, not micro, the same macro approach, but people don't know it's the same. But they're telling me the same things over and over and over again. So there's something here and I want to share it. And that was my first thing because I want to share stuff. I don't want to hold things to myself. I want to get it out. But the second was what you were talking about because it was immediately hit with that insecurity again of can I write a book? Can I make it to the finish line of writing a book that people read and say, this is anything but hot garbage? Is it going to make sense to them the way it made sense to me? And uh, man, it should have taken me six months to write this book because I'd already done years of research. It took me three and a half years to finish the book. And for no other reason than my own insecurity. I've actually got a course out now from blank page to 300 and, uh, from blank page to publish in 365, where I help people write a book in a year. Cause I say, please don't waste the time I wasted. If you have somebody in your corner, they can help you cut through that insecurity. But the book was incredible because it was a way of me saying, Hey, I can share what's happened in me and help other people. But it was also a way of saying, yes, this is, this is proof of concept on the days when I have bad days, I can pick it up and say, no, this book's affected people. This book has impacted people. This book has made sense. So if I don't feel like it today, if I don't feel good about it, if I don't feel like I had the energy to go help people, if I you know, have a day where I'm feeling the imposter syndrome and wondering, am I really just a fraud? And I go back to the things I know, you know, things like I talked about earlier, what, what does God say about me? But I go back to things like the book and say, no, it's been proven. It's been proven that I can make an impact, but the, the choice is mine. Am I going to do it today just because I feel like it? Am I going to quit on the days I don't feel like it? Or am I going to believe that I am who I am on my best days, still on my worst days? but I got to get over that hurdle. I got to step out. So man, the, the book was, it was a lot of things. It was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's probably the greatest accomplishment. This taught me there's nothing that I can't do if I put in the work. And it's taught me more than that. There's nothing other people can't do if they're not willing to put in the work and, and, and learn the lessons they need. I'm going to, go off on a tangent here a little bit. Well, not a tangent, but I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to pull out to your pocket. So yeah. I, all I've been doing is watching your face and watching your eyes and watching your mouth and, and hearing your words, but really just watching your body language. Have you thought 
ever of writing your life story? Not yet. I think, and I, I and the reason I asked that, and I wrote mine by accident. It wasn't I wasn't trying to write a book. If somebody would have told me 15 years ago, write your life story, I would have told them I'm not ready to write that yet. But it ended up being written and it was the greatest thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. I think your passion, like your heart, how it exudes out when you speak and your sincerity and your authenticity and your passion for, for doing work that is God-like and that is driven to the, to the passion for Christ I think if you were to go back and write your life story in whatever way that you would write it, whether it's a chronological or we're taking a you know, segment of your life and, and really just focusing in on that, whatever that would look like, I think it would be brilliant. And I think it would be the thing that um, allows you to grow exponentially in your purpose because you have something inside of you that needs to be shared so someone else can go to it and at any point in time. You know, when people read my book, the parts that they resonate the most with are the ones that I wrote. I wrote 26,000 words in one night over eight hours. Um, mm. And that was my moment with God. And those memories of my brother that I wrote in those 26,000 words became the basis for this book and are the most real i literally relived them and wrote them and i think yeah. you what you're doing would be exponentially improved and, and elevated and next leveled by having a resource where somebody can go i can learn more about myself through your life story but i think the thing that people are drawn to with you is is what I just said, your sincerity, your authenticity, your passion, your belief in God. And it's that trust factor. And yeah. a book that shares who you are and what you've been through and why you believe that you're on this 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 journey that you're on to help people, that book would be the greatest compliment to what you do. That's just literally what I just, when you were talking, that's all I could hear God telling me is he needs to write a book about his life. Um, hmm. Because it's a very eerily similar to mine. Um, I was a drug dealer in high school. Uh, I uh, yeah, went through the writing business. I had uh, a hall pass forgery business. I had all kinds <laughs> of different entrepreneurial <laughs> works when I was in high school, um, all while being a pastor's kid and uh, the son of a teacher. But I, I think... The greatest gift you can share with somebody is your life. And when you allow somebody in your life, it's tough to allow somebody into your life through words, through interaction. It's that's a time commitment, right? Yeah. For somebody to truly get to know Jeff Cochran at that deep level. But when you can put that down in words, and I and I haven't read your book, but I can only assume it's going to be very well written and written with a voice. You know, that they always say the best book are when you can hear the author's voice or the character's voice if it's a nonfiction, it's a fiction book. Yeah. And people would tell me they could hear my voice even they, before they ever met me, or they could hear my brother stutter. And and when I would talk about his stutter, like that, to me, that's just the, it's the connectivity to someone's soul and their heart that can be found through the pages of a book is something yeah. that you you could do now. And it would be the greatest complimentary piece to where you're going. Yeah. And man, you know, I've got a, I've got a goal. And uh, when I talk about it, it generally scares other people more than it scares me. But my goal is to start this year writing a book a year. I have no clue what they're going to be. You know, I've got the next couple outlined and ready to go. But um, because I believe in that gift of writing. And I believe I get better every time I start writing things down. Like I learn better as I'm moving. But, um, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the kick in the pants that I needed. And that's why I love challenging people because people need that. You know, I've had one idea that is just a piece of my life, um, but maybe it needs to be more than that. Um, but it's kind of this whole idea, and you know, growing up as a, a preacher's kid, you'll be familiar with the story of Joseph, but 
the story of Joseph has really resonated with me for, um, gosh, the past three years, very specifically, um, life is filled with hallways where you go, Hey, why is this happening? This makes no sense. How is good going to come out of this? You know? And uh, I think about Joseph, the guy got sold into slavery by his brothers only after they said, Hey, we might get caught if we kill him. Right. They wanted to murder him, uh, just because of, well, because of his talent, because he was a little bit of a jerk, you know, but he, he gets into Egypt, he gets sold as a slave to a guy named Potiphar, but then he blows up everywhere he goes, things are, are happening great. So he gets elevated in Potiphar's house and then he gets accused of rape, right? He gets falsely accused of rape. Now he's in prison and he's thinking, okay, I was, I was in that pit. I was sold to slavery. Now I'm in prison. What's going on? And he gets elevated in prison because they notice these gifts inside of him. And, you know, he helps some, some people in royalty get restored to their positions, ends up with an audience in front of the King. Long story short, the guy ends up being the second in command of the of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at the time. Yet he has to come face to face with his brothers. When he is at his most powerful, he has to come face to face with his brothers and he has the power to say, no, you don't get food, you don't live anymore. Yet he shows them mercy and he reconciles the relationship and he calls something greater out of them. And, and that's what I've been resonating with is, that life's hallway moments, it's what I think about because really a few years ago before some of just really hard times came into my life, really hard times came in our family, I had a dream, as weird as it sounds, I had a dream that I was walking through a hall and uh, just devastated, devastated. And it was like a never ending hall. And I didn't know what was coming, but I really felt God sensing in my spirit. Long story short, I woke up from that dream and said, stuff's coming and it's going to be okay but I can't get to the celebration without walking the hall. Right. And that helped me get through some really tough times in my life. But I think so many of us, Matt, when we walk the hall of life, those halls where it feels like we're all alone and things aren't working out, we quit. When so often at the end of the hall, the hall is the prerequisite to the dreams that have been in our heart the whole time. So, you know, maybe as you say that, maybe that's my wake up call to say it's more than just moments out of the past few years. Maybe it's moments from the life, from my whole life, because every time I've had a moment of breakthrough, it's come after a moment of, of pain. It's come after a moment of brokenness. It's come after a moment, one of those hallways where I just said, God, get me out of this. And uh, there's stuff that I would never want to live through again. But if I didn't live through those moments, I wouldn't be who I am today. So um, I anyway, and I appreciate your hallways. words. I'm just saying, hallways might be the best got the, the best title for that book. You know, and it's funny, you just said that, that People ask me a lot, not, you know, when people hear my life story, like, oh, dude, I had no idea. Or what, you know, that, like that happens all the time. But, and people sort of take a step back when I say this. The greatest pain was the greatest gift that I've ever received. My brother's death was the worst thing that's ever happened to me, still to this day. But without it, I wouldn't be where I am today. I'm I'm 100% convinced of that. I was heading down a destructive road of of self annihilation um, through anger, through disappointment in my biological father, who's not a pastor. My stepfather's a pastor. You know, just all these things in my life that I was just holding on to with this this anger at God for. Why did you screw me with this guy? And why did this happen? And but da, 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 da. and I was always uh, I was always very confident in my ability to scam people. I was a smoke and mirrors kid. I, I had a 4.0, but I couldn't tell you anything that I learned because I didn't retain any of it. I just learned it mm -hmm. enough to get a, a, an A on the test, and then I forgot it. And I people thought I was this straight laced kid, and I was selling weed in the bathroom and hall passes for two bucks and writing term papers for 50, 75 and hundred bucks and getting those grades. I called, I was like Babe Ruth of term papers. I could call the grade. <laughs> I'm like, you want an A? I got an A in me and I'd write an A paper. And um, so I was, I was heading down this path of, uh, and, I, and I'm not lying to you when I say, I always wanted to be a cop, but I always wanted to be a gangster, literally equally as much. <laughs> and, and it was a toss up. <laughs> Well, which way I was going to go. And, and I'm not gonna lie. I was really good at being a gangster. Yeah. And, uh, I'm glad I ended up in the cop route clearly. <laughs> um, 
but I wouldn't have been here without my brother's death. And so that hallway analogy that you have to go through that hallway, whatever that is, that, that, that journey, that struggle, that, that loss in order to see the gift at the end, the opportunity at the end, whatever is at the end of that hallway. And I think that's a, a great analogy. And I think that's a fantastic book. Just saying, copyright that shit real quick. <laughs> it's one of the next ones up. I'm already working on it, but uh, now I feel like I need to expand it. Thanks for, for pulling some purpose out of me, man. So now that you're, you know, you're doing the, you, you did the pastoring and, and I, I believe that once you're a pastor, you're a, you're, you're a servant. I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. the word for me that I, anybody asks me who's Matt Kubler, I'm a servant. That's everything, mm -hmm. every day I do, I serve on some level, whether it's my community, my country, my family. Um, once you've been a pastor, you're a pastor. That's right. And once you have the gift of sharing God's word and interpreting it. And I think that's the key, what makes a pastor valuable isn't the ability to memorize scripture, isn't the ability to um, yeah. exude this authority. It's the ability to interpret in a way that someone else can absorb and have, have it have meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think the gift that, that you have, clearly just from our short time together, is that you have the ability to communicate and interpret life through the lens of God and purpose in a way that those that you are, you are your flock, for lack of a better word, those that you are yeah. serving can absorb and, and learn from. And however that looks, whether it's through business development or life coaching or uh, pastoral care, whatever the, the venue is yeah. that you're in, your gift remains the same. And learning how to then expand upon it, like you said, with your book, and, and taking those leadership skills. And I think that's one of the biggest things missing in our, in our youth. And I did, I, I do leadership development. I do youth mentorship and I've been doing that for 30 years. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed in, in as a common thread is that leadership development is woefully inadequate throughout their life, not to mention yeah. at the age when it should be cultivated and molded, which is when a kid is, you know, 13 to 18 is when you can really have an impact in, in how a kid can, yeah. can become a leader. What is your um, leadership principles, for lack of a better word? What are the things that you, the tenets of, of what you speak about as far as leadership? Yeah. A and B, do you find your success rate? Because I, my success rate is 100% with kids and, and about zero with adults because I just don't care about changing <laughs> and, and undoing all the the matrix of their life to try to get through to them as adults. I like I like the the raw clay. I don't want yeah. to have to rebuild the pottery. Um, where where do you find your most success in developing? Yeah. That? So let me answer the second one first, and I'll go back to the first part of the question. But um, honestly, man, I find my success um, with adults with students. It doesn't really matter. I find my success with people who want to bet on themselves, right? So when I coach people, one of the things I say at the very beginning is if I'm coaching an individual or if I'm coaching a business leader, it really doesn't matter. Um, if you go more than two weeks without engaging in the homework that we've agreed upon, I'm firing you. And they'll look at me and they'll go, Jeff, you're, you're brand new to doing this full time. You if I care more about helping you than you care about helping you, right? But if you're willing to put in the work, we'll get there. So my greatest success rate comes with those willing to put in the work. But a lot of the things that I do, Matt, it, it's, it's kind of made as a filter. I try to make a, an early filter. So there's an early ejection point. If you ask me to coach you and you hear that at the beginning and you say, okay, it's not going to work. Okay. But one of the things I'm doing right now, because I see it just as much as ministry is when I was a full-time pastor, I'm starting uh, on April 5th, and it'll run through May 5th, a 30-day jumpstart challenge, where I said 30 days, $30. For a dollar a day, you get live teaching, you get live interviews. I'm giving away two coaching sessions to every participant in there. I'm giving away $3,300 worth of value for $30 to every person. But $30 means you have some skin in the game, so you're going to try it, right? 
But then the other thing is I say, hey, it's a money back guarantee. If you're willing to bet on yourself for 30 days, if you win, it's because you bet on yourself. If you fail, it's because I didn't help you well enough. So I'm putting all the money back for 30 days and say, you have a 30 day money back guarantee. If you don't reach the goal we agree upon, you get all your money back. Well, man, sometimes people say that's not ministry. I look at it and I say the chance to help a hundred people in one month, take massive steps toward their dreams. Some of them are going to start podcasts. Some of them are going to start writing books. Some of them are going to start businesses. Some of them are just going to you know, lose 10 pounds. But the number one goal that people in America have is to lose weight. That's easy. The number two goal, what do you think it is? Happiness, finding some sort of inner happiness. It's to stop procrastinating. That's great. The number two goal is to stop procrastinating because deep down, we all know the reason why we're not hitting our goals. The reason why we're not living out those dreams is because we're scared. We're waiting. So, you know, if I can find people, even with that built-in filter, are you willing to put $30 on yourself? Are you willing to bet $30? But I'll build my client list through that because there's 10, 20% of those people who say, I want to bet more on myself, right? And if I can find somebody, Matt, who is willing to bet on themselves, they're willing to at least borrow my belief in them. We can take them anywhere they want to go. But if it's a person who's not willing to bet on themselves, they're not willing to borrow belief, you, you can't do anything with insecurity until someone's ready to say, hey, I want to walk out of this insecurity. So for me, that's kind of the crux, the linchpin, because I do really well with, with younger teenagers, um, you know, then people all the way up to 50, right? But they have to want it. So that's kind of, I think, where I do best. Um, the leadership tenets I teach, I teach 15 in the book, and that's the approach that I've used in, in my leadership for the last four or five years. It's my approach that I've used with tons of businesses, with nonprofits, with churches, but I boil it down to three things because we talk about 15 things. We'll be here all day. And the book is designed where you don't read all 15 things at one time. Okay. But right. the book is designed this way. There's three main things that every next level leader has to have. Like they're non-negotiables. You have to have an inner drive. No one else has, no one else can be responsible for getting you passionate, getting you energized. You have to bring your own energy. You have to bring your own weather. That's inner drive. And there's, there's five traits that fit under that. The second is you have to have an outward focus. If you're driven and you've got all the other right stuff, but you're about you instead of other people, about customers, right? Every great leader has a people focus, an outward focus in some ways. There's five different traits under outward focus, different ways that can look and manifest. And then the third thing, I've got the inner drive, that outward focus. Every great leader has what I call a discipline determination. They have the discipline and determination to make the hard choices consistently that most people make rarely. Okay. Like it, for instance, writing a book, everybody's different. You wrote 26,000 words in one sitting, right? I had to get up at four and 5 a.m. and sometimes stay up until three and 4 a.m. to write because I had to write 500 words every day. It had to be done. There's these discipline moments where you have to make hard decisions, right? And there's five traits under that. So when a person gets the book, there's an assessment that comes with it. I've got a professional assessment that I use for businesses and companies, but it basically tells you where you're at on those three spheres, the three sides of the leadership triangle, and what you need to do to grow into balance. Because everybody's not going to be great. You don't have to be great at all 15 traits I write about to be a great leader. You have to be great at usually two to three per sphere, right? Two to three per side of the leadership triangle. So my approach is to take someone and do this, Matt, is to say, okay, what are your strengths? Awesome. Let's put them over here. You need to know them, but they're not our biggest focus right now because a strength is a strength and it's rarely going to change. Okay. If you're an eight out of a 10, the difference between being an eight out of 10 and being a nine out of 10, there's not much of a difference, but now we're going to take over here. We're going to take your weaknesses and we're literally going to just throw them over here. Your weaknesses, unless it's a critical weakness, working on them does you no good because if you're a, if you're a two you out of 10, Thank God you said that, dude. Yeah. I was like, I was, and, and I, I, I know you're in a groove, but that literally is one of the greatest things that I, I think you can tell somebody. And I, I have a, a and it, I wouldn't recommend you use it in your world, but for me, you know, becoming marginally less sucky at something just isn't worth the time. Right? <laughs> like that's, that's, that's right. really what happens when you spend a lot of time working on your weaknesses. You just become marginally less sucky at it. 
but you still suck. Right. So I don't, I put those in the never, you know, if it's a, uh, and I always, I always separate it from a, a natural to like, if you are choosing to be lazy and that's why you suck at something, I can work on why you're lazy. And maybe yeah. that thing that you suck at won't suck anymore. But if you suck at it because you inherently just suck at that, then we're not really going to spend a lot of time worrying. Yeah. About it. Right. Well, you if you're a it, two out of a 10, you don't worry about it. Yeah. If you're a two out of a 10 on any of those leadership traits, you can spend a decade working at it to become a four out of a 10. Right. A four right. out of a 10 That's is still right. below average. What, what's it going to do to help you? Right. So here's how I focus. Take the strengths, know them, keep them over here, take the weaknesses, throw them in the trash. Unless it's like a critical, there's something that you can do to just make it not critical. Right. Most people are defined by their blind spots, what I call borderline strength traits. So if you think about it, when you talk about somebody having a blind spot in leadership, Matt, it is never usually something where they don't know anything about it, where they just totally suck at it. That's not a blind spot. People know where, they, where they're where they not good. People also know where they're strong for the most part. What the struggle becomes is like I used to have people, and this is funny because this was a leadership blind spot for me. Loving people and listening to people were two of my leadership blind spots, right? And when people would tell me early on in my career, they'd say, Jeff, you don't listen well or you don't, you don't quite love people the way that you could. I would say, no, that's not true. And I would give them examples of how I had loved people, listen to people, and they told me it was good, right? I had examples of how it was a strength. But the, the truth was, I was good enough at it to not be terrible, but I wasn't good enough for it to be a strength yet. And it was a blind spot because I was operating as if I was strong when I was really just okay. So when I dove into those areas, when I started writing this book and I realized, oh, holy cow, I'm not where I thought I was, right? My own assessment told me, that I stunk where I thought I was, was better. Well, if I was a six or a seven at those, and I needed to be an eight or above to, for it to be a strength, a six or a seven with intentional development, anybody can make that a strength within six to 12 months. Yep. Right. So don't focus on your strengths because they're already there. Don't focus on your weaknesses. It's where do I need balance and need to grow to become the best version of me? So I tell people when they get the book, I say, my, the best thing about my book is this, you can read the first introduction chapter. You can take the assessment. It's going to tell you the three things you need to work on today. You read those three chapters, the end and say, I'm done. I read that whole book. Right. But you can come back to it the next time you take the assessment and you're growing in a different area. You just come back and read those chapters. So you're not having to be overwhelmed by a whole book at one time. It's saying it's leadership is not one size fits all. It's what do you need to do to become the best version of yourself? So I tried to write that book to where it's really choose your own adventure. It's where am I at? If I can know where I'm at and know where, what I need to get where I need to go, then I can choose the path to get there. So if a thousand people take the assessment, they're going to get a thousand different paths to leadership development because it is specific to you. I love that. That's a brilliant concept. And I've, I, uh, I'm not gonna lie. I don't read much <laughs> books. I've written two more, but I don't read much. Um, I was an air marshal after 9-11, sitting on airplanes, sitting in airports, sitting in hotels. I read a lot. Um, that was during the time when I was writing the book as well. So I, I, I figure mm -hmm. I got enough reading in. Um, and I didn't read in high school. When I was writing those term papers, I, I'm a bullshit artist. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I, I read the first and last page of each chapter, read the cover dust jacket overview of the back, learned a bit about the author and the rest. I kind of just figured it out and I wrote it well enough to where I could get good grades. But I never really put the time investment into reading. And what I, I've learned is that I'm, I'm an auditory learner anyway. Yeah. So I listen to a lot of the self-help books and, and auditory books. And um, I, I think leadership, <clears throat> it's not rocket science, right? It, it's really yeah. not. It's, it's a lot of, it's a self-awareness component. It's a passion and purpose and want component like you talk about, you gotta have that drive. Um, and I, I wrote, you know, most of my, my leadership stuff geared towards youth, but you try to get a kid to understand what a leader is. They always think it's a title, mm -hmm. right? Uh, president, uh, pop, teacher, uh, pastor, whatever. It's it, and sometimes that's true, but it's not what a leader is. It's not the essence of what leadership is. So you I can have say, a title and not be yeah, a leader. Absolutely. You can be a terrible leader with a great title. Absolutely, and 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 but they don't see they don't what you don't know you don't know right if you haven't been exposed to it, mm -hmm. and that's why I like kids because they're always like sponges and when you give them new tidbits of information they're like oh my god um but i would give them this definition leadership is simply the ability to give your time energy and effort to someone else without wanting anything in return 
Like that's kind of what servant leadership is more or less. And, and giving kids examples of how on a daily basis they can use that definition and employ yeah. it in their life and give them moments where they have, like if you have a friend that was getting picked on or bullied and you stepped in and got that kid away from the bully, you were a leader because you just did something for someone else without wanting anything in return and made that person's life better. And you just change their dynamic of that day. And that's leadership and giving them yeah. all these different ways they can employ it and then challenging them to do that. And then having them come back or write journals about how their day went and how they were able to utilize leadership in their life. And it's just like you said, you can, in six to 12 months, you can create usable leadership skills that then, that's right. And, and we don't, you know, we're selfish a little bit in that we do a lot of our stuff because it makes us feel good. Right. There's this, mm -hmm this inner uh, satisfaction that comes from helping. And I tell people that's the greatest high you could ever get is when yeah. you know you impacted somebody's life positively and, they, and whether or not they're overly gracious or not, it doesn't matter. You know in your heart that you changed somebody's life and that's the, something you can do all day, every day. And no one yeah. doesn't call you an addict, right? So well, I told you earlier, you know, about my history as being an addict. And I've always said that, you know, because people would say, how did you change overnight? I said, what? Well, I didn't change. I was really just transformed. God didn't take my addictive tendencies. Those were in me for a reason. Yeah. I just changed what I was addicted to. I went from being addicted to trying to get high and, and you know, fill myself up to now my high is making an impact in other people's lives. And it changed. But man, we, we grow up, people say things like, oh, you're ADHD. That was a label that I got, right? Um, or you have an addictive personality. That was a label that I got. Yes, both of those things are a part of what make me great if I can figure out how to use them, they're not disabilities. You know, my ADHD, man, I have a, I have a plethora of energy and I can connect dots that most other people can't connect. That's why I can walk into a business organization, a church does not matter. And within a couple of days of just talking to other people, I can say, okay, here's, here's the issue. Here's how we can solve it. Let me walk with you. Right. It's the superpower of ADHD. I just think differently. Right. Well, it's the same thing with, with addiction. The addiction isn't the worst. It's not like we need to cut out that part of us. We need to redeem that part of us. I was addicted to the wrong things, right. but I was created to have an addictive personality because you ask anybody, man, anybody who knows me and they will say this, if Jeff is working on a project, you are not pulling him out of it. If Jeff's connected with someone and coaching someone, you're not pulling him out of it. Like he's going to see it through to the end because it is that addictive personality. So Sometimes we need to take the labels people put on us in our whole life. You know, you got listeners right now who are listening their whole life. They have been told different things about themselves that they need to fix. Maybe you don't need to fix them. Maybe you need to point them in the right direction. They're there for a reason. Don't try to fight against who you are. And that's why I try to develop leaders this way. Don't fight against who you are. Leverage it. Because I really do believe there's greatness in you. Let's figure out how to put that puzzle together. That's a great way to look at it. It's a... And I've talked to a lot of business leaders, a lot of coaches, a lot of people in, in similar spaces as us. And that's the most logical, like I, I'm a logic guy. Everything I do is, yep. is, it doesn't make logical sense. Is it more probable than plausible? Like I, I work in certain tangents and, and worlds um, in order to problem solve. And everyone wants to make their voodoo sound so unique and obscure and that I possess it and I'm the keeper of all this information. When in reality, it's just logical understanding of human behavior and tendencies and That's right. And and helping someone. I've never used that. And I'm going to, I'm stealing that by the way. Um, is that free. redirection of, of addiction, that redirection of of whatever the thing is that may currently be causing them to be stagnant or set back or, or holding them back and redirecting it towards something that will benefit them and help them and help others. So I think that's a, it logically just simply makes sense. And I have an addictive personality, um, um, generational alcoholic. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I, I completely get, and I think that's part of my, you know, when I'm committed, I'm committed. I'm all in forever. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I've taken most of my, my negative addictions and those those tendencies and redirected them in places where I I can be purposeful and, and have value in in that skill set that I have mm -hmm. of being committed to things. 
sometimes um, too much at night. But, you know, that, that's the way life is sometimes. But I think what you do logically makes sense. And, and it's not so um, ethereal that it can't be comprehended. Well, man, I wrote a book and I, I say that in the introduction. I'm not an expert who wrote a book who said, this is the way you go the way, man. I'm not the Mandalorian over here. I wrote a book and I said from the beginning, I'm a fellow journeyman, but this transformed my life. I, all I am is a guy who asks a bunch of questions from really smart people, right? And then I'm writing down what I've learned. It's transformed my leadership, but I've still got a long way to go. Why don't you come with me? You know, sometimes we want to be the expert, you know, at the top of the hill. We want to be the, the hero that everybody looks to. Man, I don't want to live my life being a hero. I want to be a hero maker. Uh, Dave Ferguson says it, wrote a whole book about being a hero maker. And I don't even want my book to be the bestseller that I, I, I have a part of this year. I want my book to sell copies. That's awesome. I wrote it to help people. I didn't write it to sit on the shelf. If you're listening, you want to buy the book, buy the book. That's great. But my biggest goal this year is to actually help 25 other people with books in them start the process of writing their book and publishing it within a year. My biggest goal this year is to be able to see the books that come out in 2022 that do better than mine, right? And sometimes we feel like we have to be the hero. And, and so we try to figure out how to prop ourselves up as a hero. But if we prop ourselves up as a hero, people don't trust a hero. They just don't because they know what's inside of them. So I think every conversation we walk into, Matt, we get to be a mirror. And I can either be a mirror to who you are today. And I can remind you of exactly who you are when you look in that mirror, your deficiencies, where, where, you know, where, where you're not good enough, where you are, or I can be a mirror to your potential. Who can you be, right? And I want to choose your potential because it's easy. Everybody and their brother is going to tell you who you are today. I want to be that mirror into your potential because what you do, man, with, with mentoring young people and mentoring middle school and high school students, 13 to 18, you can see the superpowers in them. The superpower and the kryptonite are usually the same thing. It's how do you narrow it? So you look back at you, you've told me enough for me to know already that you had the same entrepreneurial giftings you have right now as a student, but there was no one calling that out of you. There was no one saying you had to hide it because if people knew what you were doing, you would have gotten in trouble. If we give kids when they're younger spaces to say, hey, let's really find out what's in them, we can point it in a direction that is so life-giving, right? Right. Because that same superpower for everybody, what is your biggest Achilles heel is also your greatest superpower. You just have to figure out how to use it. So I want to be that guy that comes along to people and says, hey, you know that thing that you think has been holding you back your whole life? What if it was your greatest gift? What could we do with that? And man, it, it frees people's whole lives up when they go, so something's not wrong with me. Maybe something's actually right with me. Right. I love it, man. Well, listen, I could do this all day long. This is... This is my wheelhouse, um, and, and I'd love to be able to do this again at some point in time. Um, yeah. But if people wanted to learn more about you, they wanted to find, I don't know, if you have a website or what is the best way for people to learn more about you, your book, your podcast, yeah. where can you send them? Well, I'm all over. So the best place is to find me at jeffcochran.online. You can find my podcast, my books, my courses, uh, link to my social media. Please follow me on social media. I'd love to have conversations with you. Um, I do answer DMs. and. People are going to see when they find me on social media, they're going to see uh, preaching and then leadership development stuff and then high challenging stuff. It, it all just rolls together. But jeffcochran.online is the best place to find everything. And on the front page of jeffcochran.online, you'll see a button that says join the 30 day jump start. So if anybody's listening, they say, hey, there's something in me. There's a dream I've been trying to pursue for a long time. I just feel stuck. If you're ready to bet on yourself, put that $30 down. I'm not going to make hardly anything off of it when you see the time I'm putting into you. But if we can wake up, I've got a maximum of 100 people that can get in this thing by April 5th. But if I can wake 100 people up into their potential, dude, that will make my month. So if you're listening, head on over to jeffcochran.online. You can join the 30-day jump start. Or if you're interested in the book, it's there too. Awesome. And I'll put the in the, in the show notes the, the website. Yeah. Um, dude, it was awesome. I'm glad, uh, glad we connected. I'm glad that uh, our... Our, uh, our journeys hit a, hit a path in the same point in the road where I think yeah. we're, we're going to be able to serve one another and help one another in our, in our future um, joys and, and struggles. 
I in think so the too, world man. of helping people. And uh, I appreciate your heart and your spirit and your passion for Christ and helping others. And I think it's, it's a place um, where you'll never go wrong if you lead with, lead with your heart and lead with, with a God-centric vision. I think you're going to be ungodly successful in everything that you try to do. And, and I'm telling you, write that book. Thanks, man. Hang tight. We'll talk off air. Everybody, thank you for watching and listening to this episode of the Two Dates and Dash podcast. I am your host, Matt Kubler. Um, once again, to learn more about Jeff, go to jeffcochran.online. Uh, to learn more about me, go to mattkubler.com. Uh, get a copy of the book. If you want to get it signed, just send me an email, matt at mattkubler.com. Um, mail me the book. I'll mail it back. And uh, I truly do appreciate anybody that takes the time to learn more about my brother, Andy, who was the most special human being ever to walk this earth. Um, thank you, everybody. God bless and go out and be kind to one another.